If you brought your Bible, you can turn with me, or you can just trust me to tell you the truth. It's up to you. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. All righty. Now, you know what we're doing? We're spending time in the book of John looking at the Father. All righty. Here's what today, the new covenant. <clears throat> Anybody ever heard the word covenant? Okay, you, we need to hear this today. Uh, how many of you know what a covenant, how many of you know what a contract is? Anybody ever had one? Covenant is the same word for contract. It's the same thing, same exact thing. It's just another word for contract. Uh, this is going to be new for some of you today, so listen hard. A uh, contract, let me tell you what a contract is. It's a binding agreement between two parties. My sweetheart and I used to have a contract with Wells Fargo Bank. And it, a contract defines this is what you do and this is what we'll do. And, it, it was a, and you couldn't just do what you wanted to do. You were bound by that contract. I think it's called a mortgage. But that's a contract. And it's also called a covenant. Well, the Bible says a lot about covenant. All right, a contract says this. Here, well, here was our contract with, here was our contract with uh, Wells Fargo. You mail us some money every month, and our part will be to let you live in our house for 15 years. And after 15 years, don't mail no more money up here, and we'll send you a piece of paper. Now it's your house. Or you can, there's a clause that said you can write a big check and get out early. That's a contract. It's also a covenant. Listen to what I'm fixing to say. Our Heavenly Father, our God, is a covenant-keeping God. That means He deals with people by covenants. You understand that? Now, he has emotions. Joy is one of them. Nobody on earth knows that yet, but you'll find out when you get there. But he's never ruled by his emotions like we are. He doesn't wake up in the morning and see how he feels and then treat you according to how he feels. He never does that. We do that. He doesn't do that. Our Heavenly Father is a covenant-keeping God. And all through the Bible you see that. And he says, I will keep covenant with you and to your children to the third and fourth generation. He's a covenant contract-keeping God. And that's how he deals with people. And uh, we're going to talk about covenant, new covenant today. Let's read some in John chapter 1. The Bible says this. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, capital Word, W. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. Jesus was the creator of the universe. Everything that was made was made by him, including you, for a purpose. Look down with me in verse uh, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What happened? God Almighty took off, laid aside His royal robes, put on a human body and came down and walked on the earth He created. The Word became flesh and dwelt, walked among us, and we beheld His glory. We saw what God was like when Jesus walked on the earth. Verse 18, Nobody has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He's declared Him. Only Jesus can show you what God is like. And that's what we're looking at here. Now, I want you to notice something. God had a covenant with people, and He dealt with them according to this covenant until Jesus came to the earth. Let me tell you what happened when Jesus came to the earth. God tore up the old covenant, threw it away, and said, I'm going to make a new covenant. And we're living under a new covenant. Most Christians I know are still living under that old covenant. You don't need to be. Let me show that to you. Look with me in John chapter 1. Uh, verse 17, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In the day of Moses, you, the, the people were under an old covenant. When Jesus came, that covenant was torn up and God wrote a new covenant. All right, tell me the name of the old covenant. It was called law. They were under the law. And uh, tell me what was the basis of the law covenant. Ten Commandments. Here's the deal. This is the contract God made with people. I'm going to give you ten rules, ten commandments. And here's, this is my part. Your part is, if you will obey these commandments and keep them, life will go well with you. You do not obey these commandments, life will not go well with you. You might have heard that. That's the old covenant. That's what people lived under. God tore that covenant up. He did away with that covenant. That was given to us by Moses, came down the mountain with the ten commandments. But what does the Bible say? The law came through Moses, but a new covenant came through Jesus. Tell me the name of the new covenant. Grace. Today we talk about grace. A new covenant called grace. And it, it's an entire new, uh, new deal. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8. I want you to see this. I want you to hear what I'm telling you today so you can live under a new covenant. 
Dear ones, there's a better way to live than trying to keep the Ten Commandments. You talk like this and people get nervous. Preachers get real nervous. Listen to me. If you don't see it in Scripture, don't believe a word I say. But we need to get back to the Bible. We need to get back to the Bible, all of it. I want you to come in Hebrews chapter 8. The Bible says this, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But now Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as He is a mediator of a better covenant built on better promises. Listen to me. When Jesus came, He brought a better covenant based on better promises. Verse 7, if that first covenant had been faultless, we wouldn't have needed a second covenant. But finding fault with them, who found fault with that first covenant? Not me. My Heavenly Father found fault with it. This is explained in Romans chapter 7. He found fault. And listen to what it said. You say, well, what's wrong with the Ten Commandments? Nothing. Nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. Romans 7 says this, if there had been a commandment given that could have brought a great life, it would have done. How many of you would agree if everybody lived by the Ten Commandments, we'd have a great planet? But where did he find the fault in? Where was the fault? Not in the commandments. In me. What was the problem? I agree with the law of God in my inner man, but I find in me a... I can't keep them. So you terrible preacher, you can't keep them neither. (laughs) Friend, the problem with the first covenant was nothing wrong with the contract. The problem was with my ability to keep it. That's first covenant. So God found fault with that first covenant uh, when Jesus came. And uh, let's read verse 7 again. If that first covenant had been faultless, you wouldn't need a second one. But verse 8, finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, which is me and you and Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers, talking about the old days. And uh, verse 10, this is the covenant. Here's the new covenant. Now, what's the old covenant? I'm going to give you 10 rules, 10 commandments. You keep them, obey them, life go good with you. You break them, you suffer. That's the old covenant. Here's the new covenant, verse 10. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. Nobody will need to teach his neighbor because they'll all know me. Verse 12. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he's made the first one obsolete. How many of you, even if you're not a Bible scholar, can see there's a new covenant? He's enacted a new covenant based on better promise. All right, the old covenant. Let me say it again. Here's your Ten Commandments. Keep them. Goes good with you. Don't steal your neighbor's Corvette. Have a good life. Amen? Steal your neighbor's wife, which, by the way, is still one of them. Steal your neighbor's wife, and within a week, you'll take her back and wish you hadn't done it. Can I get a witness? All right, here's the deal. Keep the old covenant. You keep, keep the rules. What's the new covenant? I will write my laws in their hearts. The new covenant is called grace. Instead of giving me ten rules in my hand, he takes my heart out and he puts a new heart in here, the heart of the love law of God, and I have no trouble at all being everything I'm supposed to be. It's called grace. Under the old covenant, you had to behave to be blessed. Under the new covenant, it's grace. You understand that? Most Christians I know are still stuck under the old covenant. Let me make an announcement. There's a new covenant. You can live a new way and a better way. And it's a superior, Jesus said it's a superior commandment, much more. All right. It's called grace. Can you tell me? Listen, grace is the most important word in the Bible. Grace is our life. It's what we live by. Do you know what grace is? All right, we, we're going to take this morning. We're going to define. We want to do one thing this morning. I want you to go out those doors knowing that's what grace is. All right. We're going to look in the Old Testament at a picture. Of, of grace. And this will explain, I want everybody to know what amazing grace. Well, I like that song because grandma sang it. You need to like it for more than that. When you hear the word grace, you need to go. Let's look at grace. All right, has anybody here ever read the Old Testament? In this church, you can talk back. You can't talk ugly, but you can talk back. Tell me the players in the Old Testament. Name a few. Noah, Moses, Abraham, Bubba, Sarah, that's good. These are the people in the Old Testament. Listen to me. You missed it. You missed it. Let me show you the primary verse in the New Testament you have to read before you ever read the Old Testament. Turn with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I ask you, who are the primary players in the Old Testament? John chapter 5. To understand grace, you have to know who's in the Old Testament. 
John chapter 5, I read the Old Testament, here's what I see. I see a guy named uh, Adam, I see Abraham, I see Noah, I see Moses, Nehemiah, Rebecca, I see these people. But I want you to show, let me show you who's in the Old Testament. John chapter 5, this is Jesus speaking, verse 39. John chapter 5, 39. You search the scriptures. Time out. What do scriptures mean? Look here. This is not the scriptures that he was speaking of. When he said scriptures, what did he mean? Old Testament. Remember, the New Testament wasn't written when Jesus was on the earth. So when he said scriptures, he's talking strictly Old Testament. Listen to what he said. You search the scriptures, or you search what we call the Old Testament now. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. What's these words? These are they which testify of me. Who's on every page of the Old Testament? Jesus. What did he say right there? He said the Old Testament is a book about me. He said you study the Bible, which was the Old Testament, and you think you find life in them, but he said these are they which talk about me. I see Noah... But when I see Noah, I need to see Jesus. I see Moses, who delivered people from bondage. But when I see Moses, if it's a book about Jesus, I need to see Jesus. Don't you understand the Old Testament is one giant parable of Jesus. He's on every page. He was the lamb that was sacrificed to save the people from destruction. He was the ark you could get into to find safety. Uh, he, was the, he was the tree of life that you could eat from. Jesus is all over the Old Testament. It's a book about Jesus. So what does that tell me? The Old Testament is a picture of the New Covenant, if you can see it. We're going to look at one story. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Let's turn to the Old Testament, and let's learn about grace. If we learn about grace, what are we asking? Here is what God is like. All right, 2 Samuel 9. If I were to come up to you and say, uh, you, you go to church, don't you? They say, yeah. yeah, yeah, I do. You Christian? Yeah, yeah. Well, tell me what your God is like. What would you say? Well, he's, he's big. Well, I figured that. But could you describe him according to what the Scripture says? That's what this passage is for. I want everybody to leave here today knowing what grace means and knowing that is what God is like in the New Covenant. Most Christians I know worship the God of the Old Covenant. Let's start worshiping in the New Covenant. We've got a New Covenant based on better promises. 2 Samuel chapter 9, wonderful, wonderful uh, picture here, and uh, let's, let me tell you where we're at. Uh, King David, remember, remember King David? Okay, he was a little nobody. His father said he'd never amount to nothing. God raised him up and made him the most powerful king on the world. At that time, he was the most powerful man in the world, ruled the most powerful nation in the world in its greatest day, and this is where we're at. And he's been the king for several years now. Everything's settled down. He's having a good life, and he's ruling. Watch what happened in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Now, King David said, Is there still not anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Well, there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. Y'all remember who Saul was? Saul was the king in front of David who got killed and David took his place. So what did he say? Is there anybody left in Saul's family that I can be nice to? And uh, number two, there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. They called him. David said, Are you Ziba? He said, I, I, At your service. The king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? Ziba said to the king, well, there is. There's a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Remember Jonathan? Saul had a son named Jonathan. Jonathan and David became best friends. David and John, Saul and Jonathan both got killed in the same battle. The servant says, you didn't know that your best friend had a son? Jonathan has a son. His name is Mephibosheth, but he's crippled. He's lame in both of his feet. All right, verse uh, 4, the king said to him, where's he at? Where is he? Ziba said, he's in the house of Makar, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Uh, in other words, God, I started to say something that would probably get me in trouble. He was living in the slums. He was living in the worst town you could imagine. Uh, now, I'm, 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 this is not my thing, but some people classify towns. Can I get a witness? I saw just yesterday a sign said, why are you naming your children Paris and London when they're living like Durham and Salisbury? We need to change this thing. <laughs> I was ugly. Sorry about that. If you, I'm sorry if you're from there. But you pick the worst town in America, that's where he's living. And he's living in the slums. He's living in squalor. He's crippled. All right, the Bible said this. And uh, now when Mephibosheth, uh, verse 6, now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, uh, back up a little bit. Verse 5, King David sent and brought him, said, go get him. Brought him out of the house of, you know, all them names, Bubba, Joe. All right, verse 6. 
when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he fell on his face, stretched himself out. David said, Mephibosheth? He said, here is your servant. David said, David said to him, verse 7, Do not be afraid. I will show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. I restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather. You will eat bread every night at my table. He bowed himself and said, Who is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as me? The king said to Ziba, Saul's servant, I've given your master's son all that belonged to Saul, all his house. You, therefore, your sons, your servants, shall work the land for him. You'll bring in the harvest that your master's son will have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, will eat bread at my table always. He had 15 sons, 20 servants. Ziba said to the king, According to all the Lord the king has commanded, so your servant will do. As for Mephibosheth, said David the king, he's going to eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, who dwelt in the house of Ziba. Verse 13 is the last one. Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, ate continued at the king's table, and he was lame in both of his feet. Who's that a story about? Is that a story about a king showing kindness to a pitiful little fellow? You search the scriptures, but these are they which talk about me. This is a parable to teach you what God is like. This is, my, this is my favorite parable in the Bible. And remember, this is not a story about a king 2,400 years ago that did something nice. This is God showing you what he's like. But right, if it's a parable, you've got to identify the characters. Who's the king representing? Who's King David representing in this passage? God the Father. Who is Mephibosheth? Come on, who's Mephibosheth? Me and you. Who is, who is Jonathan? That's Jesus. I will be good to you for Jonathan's sake. I'll show you kindness for Jesus' sake because of what he did at the cross. Who's the soldier? Who's the soldier who went and got this little fellow and brought him to the Father? That's the Holy Spirit of God who brings us to the Father so he can be good to us. Dear ones, this, is, this is two stories together. The minor league story is a great king who showed kindness to a little crippled fellow. The real story we see here is called the grace of God. And it's a picture of the great grace of God. All right, let me say it again. The law was given through Moses. Ten commandments keep them. But grace has come to us through Jesus. We live under a new covenant based on better promises. I'm not going to live under that, keep the Ten Commandments, everything good with you. I'm going to live under this covenant called grace. And this is a great picture of the covenant of grace right here. All right, what are the truths we get in this thing? Why was he crippled? Crippled is the major thing in this passage. It said he was crippled. You know when he got crippled? In that day, we don't do this now. I think some of them would like to, but we don't do this now. In that day, the moment a new king came into office, he killed all the previous king's family and servants to, not, to prevent an uprising. So, you know, immediate. I, you know, our politicians aren't allowed to do that. I think some of them would if they could, but they're not allowed to anymore. But back then, you killed the previous king's family and servants. All right, the moment Saul died in battle, word came back, Saul's dead, Jonathan's dead, David is now king. Everybody in the castle ran. Mephibosheth was just a baby. A nursemaid picked him up and took off running to save the whole crowd. The Bible said she tripped and fell and fell on him, and it broke both of his legs, and he never recovered, and he was crippled, crippled in the fall. Have you ever heard this, the fall of man? In the Bible, everything was perfect until man fell. It's called the fall of man into sin. We were all infected with sin. What does it mean that I'm crippled in the fall? Romans chapter 5, because Adam made me a sinner, I struggle to walk straight. Anybody here still struggles? Once in a while I hear this voice in my head that's, maybe got voices in your head. Old country song, I hear voices, I hear them too. This voice in my head says to me, beggars, you've been a Christian 50 some years. You've been a preacher 42 years and you still struggling like this? You know what the answer is? Yeah. Yep. I'm having to know because of what Adam did to me, I will struggle till the day I see Jesus. Guess what the law does to people that struggles? It beats them up. It condemns you if you still struggle. Welcome to the law. Guess what grace does to you if you struggle? It helps you. Crippled in the fall, can't walk straight. And because he was crippled in the fall, he's living in a horrible place with a miserable life. That's what crippled is. Question. Why was Mephibosheth, by the way, he was hiding. He's a 23-year-old man now. He was crippled at one year old. Why has he been hiding from David for 22? He's hiding, hoping the king doesn't find him. 
Why is he hiding from David? Because in his mind, he thought he was going to kill him if he found him. What's that a picture of? How many people do you know that think God is mad at them because of the way they live? Because they've had bad preaching or bad teaching and they think that God is disgusted with them and mad at them because of the way they've lived and one day you're going to get it. Mephibosheth hiding from God because he didn't know what he was really like is the law. A picture of the law. It's a picture of so many people that, you know, there's no sense in me going to church too late for me. If I go to church, the roof will fall in. The most important thing you'll do in your life is get to know what God is really like. And uh, that's why he was hiding from him, because he was afraid that God was going to hurt him, or the king was going to hurt him as mad at him. Number three, shocked by grace. Mephibosheth, is in, he's living in squalor. He's some filthy joint, nasty. All of a sudden, a door gets kicked open, and he's looking at one of King David's soldiers. And he stares at him, and guess what he knows? I've been found. It's over. That soldier says, Mephibosheth, you know, since lying now, matter of fact, there's more than one. <laughs> and they get him up and they put him in a chair and he's riding back to Jerusalem. Guess what he's thinking? I made it 22 years, but it's over now. And they grab him up out of that chariot and they march him through the palace door and they take him into the throne room. That throne room was amazing. And they march him into the throne room. They throw him, they, they probably just dropped him. Remember, he's crippled. He they said he prostrated himself right there in front of the throne, in front of the king. Guess what he's thinking? It's over. And he hears these words. You don't need to be scared of me. I brought you here to be good to you. I'm going to give you everything your grandfather owned. You know how much that was? Thousands and thousands and thousands of acres. Olive groves, vineyards, wheat fields. He's a multi, multi-millionaire just like that. And he said, but you don't need to worry about it. I'm going to give you 35 servants that will take care of all your stuff. But you don't need the money because you're my son today. And you're moving in my house, and I want to eat dinner with you every night. And he's, he's going, what did I just hear? I mean, that sounds too good to be true. You behave and you won't get in trouble. There ain't nothing amazing about that. I understand that. You still struggle to do right. I'm not mad at you. I'm going to show you kindness and I'm going to bless you beyond your wildest dreams. That's amazing grace. That's shocking grace. You understand what he's showing you here? This is the new covenant based on better promises. You say, Brother Brian, I don't deserve that kind of goodness. It's not for your sake. I will do this to you for Jonathan's sake. I'm doing this because of a cross 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary. You get all this. It's a picture of His goodness and His grace. Now question, what did Mephibosheth do to earn all this? Somebody tell me. Not one stinking thing. He did nothing to earn this. What kind of promise? Did he have to promise to be better? I don't see that in there either. You said, Brother Brown, this just don't seem fair. Now we're getting it. Now we're getting it. This is called grace. This, this is the new covenant. This is the kindness of God. All righty. What's the grace revealed here? What, what did David give this fella? And what's the big picture? What has God given me and you? Number one, I'm going to give you all the land Saul owned. Those are material blessings on the earth. A lot of people don't like to hear this. Take it up with the man who wrote this book. He gave him all the material blessings on this earth. Let me tell you something. I live in a beautiful home I could have never had if I didn't know Jesus. I've got, I've got great health that I wouldn't enjoy if I hadn't known Jesus. I've got all kinds of stuff. I, I mean, God has blessed me materially. Do you know what the greatest thing He's ever given me materially? Guaranteed lifetime income and you don't ever need to worry about nothing. You can't get no richer than you don't never need to worry about nothing. I mean, he's just blessed me beyond measure. A lot of people say, well, you know, we got to suffer and suck eggs and be pathetic and do without and <laughs> wear burlap bags till we get to heaven. But one day, that's not what the Bible teaches. You follow Jesus, you have to give up some stuff here. Show me that. You got to give up hatefulness. I can remember when I, I was 15 years old, a lady came and talked to me about Jesus. I said, I don't want to give up what I got to follow Jesus. She said, it's your life. Okay, let me tell you what I had. Let me can I tell you what I was going to give up? I would go out and raise hell and get drunk, spend all night with my head stuck where other people stick their butts, throwing up all night. I didn't want to give that up. 
Explain this to me. Listen to what the Bible said. A lot of people, a lot of people just flip in their pulpits when I say this. I'm quoting directly from Scripture. Mark 10, 27, 26, Simon said, We have left everything to follow you. Jesus said this, No one who has given up houses, jobs, lands, family, anything to follow me that will not receive back a hundred times as much in this life with persecutions, but let me make an announcement. People are going to fuss at you no matter what you do with persecutions and in the life to come eternal life. The picture of here, I'm going to give you all this, I'm going to give you all this stuff on the earth. Here, all right? Number two, what's this picture of? What's the 35 people to work with him? The grace of God is that God's going to bring people into your life. If you'll walk with Jesus and listen to him, he'll give you a wife or a husband that will love you like Christ loves the church. And you'll have family and you'll have friends. You'll have people that really care about you. We were Relationships the big deal, folks. It's not the houses. It's not the money. It's not the cars. It's not the stuff. It is the people. And God, the grace of God, every person in my life now came through Jesus. Matter of fact, I've recently, me and some old high school friends have reconnected, but that's the only people I got left in my life, B.C. I wouldn't have known one of you if it weren't for Jesus. I wouldn't have met my wife if it weren't for Jesus. I sure wouldn't have had my children if it weren't for meeting my wife and knowing Jesus. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Dear ones, God wants to bring you into great relationships. He wants people that, what did every one of these people in his life do to him, do for him? They served him. He wants to bring you to people that will bless you, bring you into relationships and to bless you like that. All right, tell me what the table is. What's the greatest thing? You moving in my house and me and you going to eat dinner every night. A dear ones, the Holy Spirit of God wants to be the best friend you got. And He wants to fellowship with you and eat with you. And He wants you to enjoy Him, get to know Him. This is, this is called the grace of God. This is His kindness. Now, listen to me. Let me tell you what American Christianity is. A lot of times, not always. Go to church and try to behave and quit cussing and leave some money when you walk out. Ain't nothing amazing about that. And stay awake while that fat man fusses at you during the day. There ain't nothing amazing about that. This is God's will. This is the new covenant to where he does things for us that we don't deserve. Tremendous. All right? Now listen, here's the most important thing right here. If I'm looking at this passage, the Bible is God speaking to you. The Bible is God Almighty showing you what he's like. And I read this passage, which I know is about Jesus. What am I going to come away thinking God is like? That he gave me ten rules and I better keep him around in trouble? I don't think that about him. That's the old covenant. What am I going to come away thinking about, God? Listen to what I think. Let me, tell you, let me tell you the God I love and know as a father. Let me tell you what I You know what I think about him? You know what I see from this passage? He is looking for somebody to be good to. Let me quote it to you. Is there anyone out there that I can show the kindness of God to? You know what kindness is? It's the greatest word in the Bible. It's hesed, and it means loving kindness or mercy. I'm going to be good to you just because of who I am. Is there some, listen, if the God of heaven looked at me and said, I'm going to be good to you just because of who I am, how much do you think he's got to give? I think he won't, I think, I don't think he's looking for people to judge. How many of you know if he was mad, we'd all be gone? He's that big. He's not looking, listen, I remember an old gospel song years ago, I heard it first time, and I said, where in the hell did that come from? I said it to the guy who was singing it. Here's how it went. God's going to get you for that. God's going to get you for that. You mark it down, brother, it's coming. God's going to get you for that. You know, you know what gospel singing is, don't you? Or four fat guys dressed alike, standing and point at something nobody can see while they sing. That's what it is. I'm sorry. Listen to that. God's going to get you for that. That ain't the God of this Bible. Who is the God of this Bible? Is there somebody out there that I can show great kindness to? Is there somebody that I can show grace to? Number two, I see a God in here that's wanting to bless people on earth. I don't have to wait to get to heaven to be blessed by God. I don't have time to go into it now, but He will bless you in every area. I mean every area of life. He wants to bless you in business. He wants to bless you in your friendships. He wants to, put, he wants to bring people into your life. He wants your flowers to be pretty. I mean, He wants to fill your life with... God is good. He's looking for somebody to give things on this earth. He's looking for... Can you not see... What, what, is the, what is the heart of the king right here? I just want to be good to somebody. This is called grace. This is the covenant of grace that we have. All righty, go a little further here. Now, um, number seven. 
There's something strange in this passage right here. He tells us about the, little, about the king. Looking for, I'm looking for somebody to show kindness to. I'm going to pick somebody out to be good to. And he finds out there's a little crippled fellow named Mephibosheth living down in Lodabar. And uh, he says, bring him to me. And we've already been told twice in this passage he's crippled. You got that? We've been told twice. Look at the last verse with me. Here it is. <clears throat> verse 13. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem. He ate continued at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. Why did he need to tell me that again? Why is the last thing this passage says, he is still crippled and can't walk straight? Now this offends a lot of people, but I didn't write it. What's he saying? You don't have to be perfect for God to keep blessing you. After this king had poured out tremendous blessing on him, I mean, he made him a multimillionaire, brought people into his life, let him enjoy life in the king's palace, and he still can't walk straight? He said, but go ahead and pop your cork, man. This is called grace. Let me make an announcement. If you're living under the old covenant, grace will make you mad. If you're living under the old covenant, grace will make you mad. Do you remember a guy named the prodigal son? I remember a guy named the prodigal son. Just put your name in there. And he screwed, you can't screw up no worse than he did. And he comes back home and says, I, I'm just hungry. And the father opens the windows of heaven over him and gives him, he didn't give him new stuff. It said, bring out the best. Go get my best outfit. Gave him his best cowboy boots just because he came back home. And just threw a party. I mean, what do you think that's a picture of? It's a picture of the grace of God toward people who don't deserve it. But was there another player in that story? His name was his older brother, who was a pastor. Had to have been. And his elder brother was what? Angry. What was he mad about? I have kept your rules. I have served you. You never gave me anything. And he comes home. He spent all your money on hookers, and you've given him everything you got. What's he mad about? Grace. Grace will make people angry. All through the scripture, you see people got angry about grace. I had a preacher one time, and he said, I want to say something to you. He said, you never went to seminary. You don't dress like you're supposed to. You don't act like you're supposed to. There ain't nothing preachorial about you. And you got the biggest church in our county. And I said, grace, Doc, grace. Grace makes people angry. I started dating my sweet. I started dating my sweetheart in college, and a fella from down the hall came in the dorm room, and he said, who are you going off with? I said, and I told him, he said, the hell is she doing going out with you? He was, I shouldn't say twice in one day. He, uh, he was shocked that somebody at her level would go out with somebody like me. I just went and picked her up singing Amazing Grace. It's grace. Grace is the undeserved. You can't earn it. You can't promise to do better. There ain't nothing you can pay for it with. That when, you live, when you live under the old covenant, your favorite song is Amazing Me. You live under the new covenant, your favorite song is Amazing Grace. I don't deserve this. You're not even trying anymore. And uh, th this is the kindness, the kindness of our, our great God. All right, let me ask you a question. What is God like? Nothing will dictate your life more than what is God like. I can listen to people and tell whether they're old covenant, new covenant. I want you to turn to look with, with something in the Bible. Look real quick with me. And you know what it means, look real quick when I say that. Turn me to 1 Timothy. Now, I want to show you something. Perhaps you've never seen this in the Bible before. All right, let me, let me get, let's do this again. I want you to tell me what your God is like. And I want you to do it in three words. Now, think about it. I want you, I want you to use three words. My preacher, some of my preacher friends would say, well, God is holy. And I don't know why they have to, you know, they say, holy. Like, like, makes me want to stand up straight. That's the old covenant. He is holy. The problem's our definition of the word holy. If when you hear holy, you don't think beautiful, you don't know what the meaning of holy is. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. All right, give me three words. Just, just think about what would be the three words you'd use. Big, mad, don't get you for that, whatever. I want to show you something. I told you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Listen to what I'm fixing to say. I could have told you to turn... The Romans chapter 1. 
or 1 Corinthians chapter 1 or 2 Corinthians chapter 1 or Galatians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. I could have told you turn anywhere because this is in the Bible. These are the first words of the Bible in 17 books of the New Testament. Look at this with me, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus by the commandment of God, Savior, our Lord. There's a greeting. To Timothy, a true son, look at verse 3. Grace, excuse me, verse 2. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at that verse. Those are the first words of 17 books in the New Testament. Describe God to me in three words. Let's invert them. You know what peace means? Relax, I'm not mad. Mephibosheth came and fell down before the king, just knowing he's going to kill me. And David said to him, I'm not mad at you. You don't need to be scared of me. You know what that's called? Peace. I've heard people say they're going to make peace between them and God before they die. You're not going to do it. Why would you think you could do that? You're under the old covenant. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Having been justified by faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus and what He did on the cross. I've had peace with God ever since Jesus died on the cross. You know, you know what peace means? There ain't nothing wrong between me and you. Tell me what mercy is. Anybody know what mercy is? Mercy is when you do not get what you do deserve. I'm a, I, the one of the reasons I'm so happy, I live under mercy. There's no pressure on my life. Even if I do make a mistake, guess what? He's the most forgiving man I know. Brother Brian, you make me nervous. People are going to sin if you live like that. People are going to sin if you preach like that. Get out of my church. Well, no, no, stay. You need to learn something. Listen to me. I don't run around on my wife. Been married 42 years, hadn't run around on her one time. It's just because she's a dang old. No, that's not it. And listen, you know why? It's not because I'm scared of what she'll do to me. I love that woman. She has loved me like I've never been loved before. Under the law, you serve out of fear. In the new covenant, you serve out of love. There's a big difference. You're not motivated out of fear. You're motivated out of, you know why I, I walk with Jesus and love me? You know why I don't cuss, I start saying I don't cuss people out? Not a good day to say that, is it? <laughs> he has replaced, now, some people have said to me, you mean we're supposed to throw the Ten Commandments away? Go ahead. I know I'm getting in Harrison now. Go ahead. I don't need the Ten Commandments. You don't need to put nothing in my hand. He has written His law in my heart. I don't need it in my hand anymore. You know what the law is? All the commandments are bound up in this word. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Can I ask you a simple question? If I love you, am I going to steal your Corvette? You're not going to steal nobody's Corvette when you love them. Am I going to steal your wife? I wouldn't do that if I didn't. <laughs> that ain't happening. Am I going to tell a lie about you if I love you? You don't need to give me the Ten Commandments. God has put something in my heart. This is the new covenant. We live in the Spirit, no longer in the letter. This is so much fun. You know, if, you're, so if you use the word trying, Brother Brown, I'm trying, you're under the old covenant. You're still trying. We trust Him for this. And this, this great... Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 says this, Grace, mercy, and peace are what I have from God my Father. There's peace with me and Him. I don't have to promise to behave, although I will. I have mercy for my sins. Uh, anybody here ever had your past come into your mind? Where'd that come from? Guess where it didn't come from? You know where it couldn't have come from? Let me quote. I read it to you earlier, Hebrews chapter 8. This is the covenant I will make with them. I will put my law in their hearts and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Well, if he don't remember them, he sure don't talk to you about them, does he? Sound to me like somebody else is in that head. Tell him to go to hell. You can say that about him. Throw him out of your head. I'm riding down the road one day, and I'm praying, singing, having the best time, and this thought came into my mind, you don't deserve that. And I just answered him back. I'm getting good at spotting him. I answered him, and I said, well, if you'll listen to the end of my prayer, I'm not going to say in the name of Brian. I'm going to say in the name of Jesus, I pray. I've sometimes, I got to where I feel sorry for the devil messing with me. He's going to go home with knots on his head. Peace, mercy, and what is grace? Grace, mercy, what is grace? It is when God unloads on you even though you don't deserve it. In every area, every, every place, He gives you favor with people, he blesses you. He, he just pours out such grace on us. Tell me the three things you get from the God of this book. Grace, mercy, and peace.
Those are the three things we live under. That's His great kindness under the new covenant. All righty? I'm going to give you a test. You ready for a test? Let's find out which one you live under. Here, here's a test. I want you to, I'm going to give you two words, and one of these words will show you which one you live under. If, if the word that describes your faith, if, you, if the word trying describes your faith, you stuck dead in the middle of the old covenant. I'm not trying to do anything. If the scripture teaches, nowhere do you find the word try in the New Testament, as far as our life. If the word trusting and hollering describes your faith, you live it under the new covenant. That there's no sense trying anything. You looking at me funny. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. Let's do one more. You know what it means, one more. Let's do one more. Galatians chapter 2. All righty. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, find this getting a bit of Galatians chapter 2. All right, you ready? Thank you, sir. All right, Galatians chapter 2. <clears throat> Now, a lot of people know that by grace are you saved through faith. Didn't earn it, just had to ask for it. Why are you going to stop there? Why don't you live the rest of your life like that? Colossians says this, the way you receive Christ Jesus, walk you there. Why don't you live your life today the same way you got saved, by grace? I want you to look with me in um, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Do you know you was there with Him? He said, Brother Ben, I don't understand that. You don't have to understand it. Will you believe what He said? You were on the cross that day with Him. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I'm still alive. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in this body, I live trying my best day to day not to screw up. Is that what it says? That's the old covenant. It was, I've been crucified with Christ, but I'm still alive. But the life I live in my day-to-day life, I do not live by my own effort. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. The same Jesus that saved me better keep me from cussing somebody today. It's called faith. Look in the next verse. I do not push aside the grace of God. You know, why would you push aside the grace of God? Why would you say to God, I don't need your help. I can do it on my own. I'll try to do the best I can. Why don't you trust the one who died for you to live it through you? And to be your strength. All right, let me close by saying this. Back to the contract. I told you that my sweetheart and I had a contract with Wells Cargo, Wells Fargo. And you know what the agreement was? We mailed so much money every month for 15 years. Uh, We didn't go that long. Mailed so much money for every month, 15 years. At the end of 15 years, we could stop mailing the money and they would mail us something called a mortgage. That was the deal we had. What if Mr. Wells Fargo was to call me up and say to me, oh, you know, we've been in this contract for, say, five years now. He said, I tell you what I'm going to do. I, I want to tear that contract up and write a new one. And I'll say, I don't know about that, Doc. I'm pretty deep in the game. <laughs> I said, well, what do you want to, what's the new contract? He said, I'll tell you what we'll do. Instead of under this old contract where you mail us money every month and then after 15 years we'll give you our house and you can live in it till then, how about a new contract that says we'll make the payments for you every month for 15 years? And you can live in it now, and then in 15 years, I'll just mail you the mortgage. You know what stupid would be? No, no, I'm not going to do that. I've had this contract a long time now, and I'm knee-deep in it. Besides, I I just want to show you that I'm I'm able to pay. I I can do this. God, I I, I can handle this. Just forget your new contract. I like the old one. You know what he's going to say? Your business. Stay there if you want to. Let me make make an announcement. That is malignant stupidity. To stay under an old covenant when you can be under it. It's your money. It's your effort. You know what? If, a man, if the Mr. Wells Fargo would say that to me, I would say, I'll be there in 10 minutes. I like this new contract. Dear ones, I was saved by grace. I got into a church that taught the old covenant. And they kept us under the old covenant. And they emphasized rules. You know how you can know somebody's under the old covenant? They're angry. Angry people are living under the old covenant. Mad about sin. Talk about sin. Focused on sin. I thought our folks were supposed to be on the Son of God. And uh, so I, I tried my best. Well, here's the problem with the old covenant. Here's the problem. You say, well, man, the Ten Commandments keep from sinning. No, they won't. They will make you sin. You didn't know that. 
Listen to what Romans says about the Old Covenant. The law, the Old Covenant, will stir the passion of sin in you. See if you agree with me right here. See if you agree with me. I'm going to use two illustrations. One for them and one for you. You take your four-year-old, put him on the bar stool, set him at the counter. You take that cookie jar, put it in front of him, take the lid off, and tell him, I got to go back in the back room and do something. Don't you touch them cookies. Hear me, boy? And you walk off. Listen to me. He wasn't even thinking about them cookies till you brought them up. It didn't bother him one bit till you told him he couldn't have one. Guess what? As soon as you clear the corner, he's going to jam that hand down in that jar. He wasn't even thinking about it till you laid the law down. The law cannot deliver you from sin. It'll make you want to sin. Who wants to live under that? And then guess what? And then today he'll come back in and mother will, if mother walks back in today and sees him, she has to get counseling because she's failed as a mother. My mama will walk back in. <laughs> My mama would be all over your heads. <laughs> it's changed. Dear ones, here's a, here's a saved man. He really loves Jesus. He struggles with pornography. He lives under the old covenant beats himself up I can't I've got, I can't I can't do this I can't you know what you're doing you are making the desire greater the law stirs the passion of sin humble yourself humble yourself go to Jesus and say you know help me I'm in trouble I can't do this God blesses humility not self-effort a dear friend of mine he was a, a chief deputy in our county and I was his chaplain we were buddies he said, let me tell you what I did. He said, I smoked for years. And he said, and this is such a great picture. He said, I smoked for years. And he said, I, uh, I knew it wasn't good for me. And I finally decided I was going to quit. So I made up my mind, I'm going to quit smoking. He said, so I quit for a day. And he said, I, I, could, I could just taste them things, eat them things. And he said, I quit. And I, and I went back and then I felt terrible. Because, you know, after you promise to do something and then you screw up, you feel terrible. Dear ones, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And he said, and he said, I did that back and forth. I'd quit and then I'd start again. Just wanted them so bad, beat myself up. And he said, finally, one morning I get up and I'm in the bathroom and I'm shaving. And them cigarettes are laying there. And he said, I just looked in the mirror and I said, Dear Jesus, I can't do this. If you don't help me, I'm going to die from them things. He said, I've never touched one cent. You know what that's called? Grace. People keep forgetting. It was grace, amazing grace that saved me. But listen to me. This grace that's brought me safe this far, grace is going to get me home. I'm going to stay under grace. I'm going to live under the grace of God. And this kind of life here, instead of being nervous about whether you're going to mess up and afraid God's going to get you for that. <laughs> I love my boys. You wake up every morning saying, thank you. How good you are. How great thou art. That ain't great me no more. We live under the grace of God. And we finish under the grace of God celebrating like that. All right, where are you living at? Where are you living? Are you living under the law? Are you living under grace? Listen, you need to take that new contract. You need to take up the man on his offer that the same Jesus that saved you from sin will live you into you to save you under everything. Dear ones, this life was never meant to be lived under the Ten Commandments. It's meant to live by the Spirit of God. You don't need to be smart. You don't need to be tough. Human flesh won't carry you but so far. What's the word? Humility. Humility. Bow your heart before Him and say, I need you every hour. All right, we're going to close by asking a simple question. If you died tonight, you're probably not going to, but there's, there's a possibility you could. If you died tonight, do you know for certain? Do you know for certain you'd go to heaven, you'd be with Jesus for all of eternity? You know for certain. Dear ones, you're not ready to live till you're ready to die. A lot, a lot of people don't, so don't, I don't like to talk about that stuff. You was planning on living to how old? Dear ones, you're not ready to live till you're ready to die. And uh, I apologize to all of you that have seen what churches have done to the goodness of God. Get your eyes off people and get them on the Son of God. You turn your eyes on Jesus. He's wonderful. There's a reason that man died on the cross. You know what the reason is? Because you couldn't save yourself, he had to do it for you. If there's something you could do to save yourself, he wouldn't have had to die, you could have done it. But him hanging on that cross proves that there is goodness with the Lord. And I want to make an announcement. I don't care if you're, I don't care if you're a hell's angel. It don't matter. God's not mad at you. 
He loves you. God demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Nobody's ever loved you like Jesus loves you. But He will not force you. Everybody has to make a decision. Everybody comes to this crossroads in life, some time in their life, where they got to decide, I'm going to go with Jesus and follow Him. Do me a favor, don't become religious. Follow Jesus. Or, I don't need what that man did for me on the cross. I'll do my own. A friend of mine witnessed to a man named Ted Turner one time. You ever heard of a guy named Ted Turner? Started CNN news, media conglomerate. And he went into Ted's office and he witnessed to him. This had been years ago. And Ted said, I don't need your God. And I don't need the cross and I don't need that stuff. He does. He just didn't know it. Tragedy. You get a chance to accept Jesus as your Savior. This is your time right now. Now, if you want to accept Jesus as your Savior, <clears throat> you don't need to join a church. Churches don't save. You don't need to promise to do better. He knows, he knows you can't do it apart from Him. You simply accept Jesus as your Savior. Just as surely. What's the only thing Mephibosheth did? He agreed to live in the king's house. He accepted the kindness that this great king showed him. It's your time. We're going to pray a prayer in just a second. And you, you don't need to come up here. I don't, I don't do all that. Raise your hand. Come up here if you raise your hand. Let me point you. I don't do, you don't need to do that stuff. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's that simple. And you say, I want to follow you, Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I love you. Thank you so much. I want grace to be amazing. I want to pray for two people in this room. I want to pray for the person that is a Christian. They know if they fell over, they'd go to heaven. They know they'd, be, they'd see you face to face, but they're still stuck under that old law or part of it. Lord Jesus, one of your harshest words was the book of Galatians. It says, why would you go back to the law when you can live in my spirit? I pray for people to live in grace. Now, Lord Jesus, I want to pray for the other person. Good, bad, ugly, it don't matter. But they never bowed their knee and said, I need you. I pray for that person today that they will respond to your invitation to become a son or daughter of the living God. Thank you for the promise that as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. And I just pray you draw them to yourself right now. Thank I love you. Thank you for coming and getting me. Thank you that you weren't, I'd been taught you were mad. You weren't mad at me at all. You've been good to me. And I give you the praise and glory. Friend, if you're seated here while we're praying and you want to trust Jesus as your Savior, I want you to pray a simple prayer, much like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on a cross because you love me. And I need you. And today I come to you and I ask you to forgive me of my sins, knowing you will because you promised you would. And I open my heart to you today. I ask you to come in, Lord Jesus. From this day forward, you are my, I declare you are my Savior. You're my Lord. You're the best friend I ever had. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. Help me. I need you. And I trust you to be my Savior and my Master and my Helper in everything you are. And I pray this prayer in the strong name of Jesus, powerful Son of God. Amen.